Welcome back to the 2020 GFA Virtual Convention. This is day five, block two, and what a morning we had in block one with such great content with all our education um, lectures and the, the wonderful performances we had from the ensembles and virtual uh, orchestras really incredibly um, inspiring. So thank you to all those uh, contributors from this morning. For this afternoon's block, uh, we have just a few uh, items that will be all kind of fabulous and, and uh, not so, so diverse as this morning in terms of uh, many presenters. We have just a few things coming up that will take a little more time. So we have a concert, two concerts first off, with Minneapolis Guitar Quartet and Duo Noir. Uh, that performance is sponsored by Strings by Mail. And then we have, uh, following to conclude the block, we have two lectures with Mark Johnstone and Steve Eccles. These are also both part of the education track. They will also both be followed by a live Q&A. Hop in the Zoom room to ask your questions. Enjoy the afternoon. we do here at Dogal is to dream and allow others to dream. For generations, musicians of the classical and modern world use our strings and appreciate their quality. About 70 years ago, in the industrial boom, my grandfather Luigi Sella used his own know-how and followed his instinct. Hi everybody, I'm Adam Del Monte and today I'm really excited to share and talk about the strings that I'm playing. Uh, I'm using Dogal strings and the model that I'm using is Diamante Medium Tension. I can't say enough great things about these strings, I absolutely love them. I've been playing with these strings for several years now and um, first time I put them on my guitar, on this Perlman guitar. Uh, I already thought this was a great guitar but it sounded about 25% better. Uh, their volume, their power, their clarity, their sustain, and the much larger spectrum of harmonics that they provide are really, really inspiring. Also, their tension is, uh, is just a very sensual and fun uh, feeling underneath the, the fingernails. And the release is very fast and very responsive to the touch. Uh, also, in the left hand, I love what you can do with the vibrato um, on these strings. It's just really, it almost sings like a violin, as you can see. It's just much easier, much more responsive to the touch. So I invite you to check them out. Dogal uh, is a company from Venice, Italy. And uh, again, the model that I use is the Diamante Medium Tension. Um, I think that is an ideal tension for both uh, but also th th this medium tension is slightly higher than your average medium tension of other strings so uh, you may not have to go with high tension if you typically use high tension so try the medium tension first 
Also, obviously, it depends on the guitar and your, your style of playing. But uh, check out these strings and I think you'll be surprised. Research of new technologies and the use of the most sophisticated and high performance materials are strictly handcrafted, allowing us to supply musicians a top level product, fairly priced. We're here to make you dream big and we'll never stop doing that. Dogal Strings. Hello, I'm Joe Hagedorn, and with me is our official group mascot, Nila. Hi, I'm Maya Rodovanlia. Hello, I'm Wade Oden. Hi, I'm Ben Kunkel, and we are the Minneapolis Guitar Quartet. We're, of course, very sad that we can't see you all in person uh, at the festival this year, but we would love to share with you some live performances from a concert we did in May of 2019. The music from this concert is centered around uh, projects we've been working on lately, uh, commissioning new pieces in collab collaboration with other performers. Um, over the past couple of years, we commissioned uh, new pieces from um, Clarissa Saad, Leo Brower, Mary Ellen Childs, and Aaron Travers. And our collaborators have been uh, Linda Chatterton on flute, and Clara Osowski, mezzo-soprano. Uh, we commissioned these pieces uh, with funding support from the Augustine Foundation, and we're just uh, really happy to, um, to get to play them. Okay, Maya. So um, one of the really um, interesting pieces that we're excited about performing always is commissioned from 2018 by uh, uh, we commissioned a piece from Leah Brower, um, and this interesting story how we came uh, to that idea. I was um, in a new music festival in Havana, Cuba, with uh, our flutist that we collaborated with, Linda Chatterton, and, and so we were just sitting in this 1960s cab and driving around, and I thought, oh, well, we should do something with quartet. You should play with quartet. What, what can we do? And then she said, wow, what about Leah Brower? So first I thought, oh, well, that's a pretty wild idea. But then again, when I thought about it later, I thought it's a great idea. So we did that, we commissioned a piece and we got this beautiful ballad um, uh, piece in the form of um, sort of short concerto. It's called Ballada del Bosque y el Ave. I have to look at that title, <laughs> which is the uh, ballad for uh, the forest and, and the bird, where guitars are the forest, right? And the flute is the bird. It's a beautiful virtuoso piece where Linda has to play lots of notes. And it's uh, um, actually inspired by a piece that Brower wrote in 1963 for a famous Cuban flutist, Mr. Odina. Um, so it, it's really very, um, we can say difficult piece in some ways and, and really lots of virtuoso passages there for flutes, um, where guitars are uh, in, in the role of orchestra. Really interesting idea, very dramatic piece. Uh, this piece was actually finished in 2018 during GFA festival. So Brower was working in his hotel room there. Um, and so we learned about that from Maestro that we met, we met in Louisville. It was very 
also interesting to meet him and to talk about the piece and get that really nice surprise that the piece is done. So uh, we hope that you will enjoy this piece and we're looking forward to play this piece again. Now Wade will tell you about some more interesting pieces that, that uh, we're planning to play or we premiered in 2019. Yeah, one of the most interesting collaborations and premieres on this concert for me was uh, Scent Songs by Mary Ellen Childs for Guitar Quartet and Mezzo Soprano. And um, one of the reasons I was so interested in it is um, I've always been interested in its synesthesia, the mixing of scents where you can taste a sound or hear a smell or something like that. And um, her uh, long term research into use of that and her compositions is very fascinating to me. And uh, the text. From, uh, from these scent songs that she wrote it was actually taken from abstracts um, that were used to inspire um, the, the people who created scents and perfumes. Um, so I think it's it's one of the most original ideas across in composition. Very fascinating. All right, on to you, Ben. Uh, so then the final piece you're going to hear uh, from this concert uh, is another premiere performance. Uh, this one is our arrangement of a piece by Astro Piazzolo, which is called Moderato Tangabile. Um, it's a short piece that we arranged for uh, guitar, quartet, and flute that he originally performed with his quintet, um, and it's a lot of fun. So once again, we're the Minneapolis Guitar Quartet, and we hope you enjoy these uh, premier performances of music by Mary Ellen Childs, Leo Brower, and Astro Piazzolo. So enjoy everybody. Hi. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Greetings from California. My name is Chris Mallet, and I'm one half of the guitar duo, Duo Noir. We're really excited to be performing a piece for you today called Biblos by Mary Koyomjin. We commissioned this piece a few years ago as part of our female composers project, which resulted in the album Night Triptych. I recorded my part here in California, and my duo partner, Thomas Flippin, recorded his part in Connecticut. The piece is influenced by Mary's trip to the ancient city in Lebanon called Byblos. There are many different techniques in this piece, such as thumb tremolo that imitates an oud, and she even incorporates some Middle Eastern dances throughout. The piece is really interesting because it's not only for two guitars, but we're playing with the backing track that she made. I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in to watch us and everyone at the GFA for inviting us. Thank you so much.
real work we do here at Dogal is to dream and allow others to dream. For generations, musicians of the classical and modern world use our strings and appreciate their quality. About 70 years ago, in the industrial boom, my grandfather, Luigi Sella, used his own know-how and followed his instinct. Hi everybody, I'm Adam Del Monte and today I'm really excited to share and talk about the strings that I'm playing. Uh, I'm using Dogal strings and the model that I'm using is Diamante Medium Tension. I can't say enough great things about these strings, I absolutely love them. I've been playing with these strings for several years now and the um, first time I put them on my guitar, on this Perlman guitar. Uh, I already thought this was a great guitar but it sounded about 25% better. Uh, their volume, their power, their clarity, their sustain, and the much larger spectrum of harmonics that they provide are really, really inspiring. Also, their tension is, uh, is just a very sensual and fun uh, feeling underneath the, the fingernails. And the release is very fast and very responsive to the touch. Uh, also, in the left hand, I love what you can do with the vibrato um, on these strings. It's just really, it almost sings like a violin, as you can see. It's just much easier, much more responsive to the touch. So I invite you to check them out. Dogal uh, is a company from Venice, Italy. And uh, again, the model that I use is the Diamante Medium Tension. Um, I think that is an ideal tension for both uh, but also th th this medium tension is slightly higher than your average medium tension of other strings so uh, you may not have to go with high tension if you typically use high tension so try the medium tension first also obviously it depends on the guitar and your your style of playing but uh, check out these strings and i think you'll be surprised <laughs> The research of new technologies and the use of the most sophisticated and high performance materials are strictly handcrafted, allowing us to supply musicians a top level product, fairly priced. We're here to make you dream big and we'll never stop doing that. Dogal strings.
Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, is everybody there? I, uh, I've, I've just got sort of a blank screen in front of me right now. And I am just going to go right into the lecture. It's, uh, wow, it's awfully lonely. So this is, this is my, um, this is uh, something I've been developing over the last couple of years. I'd like to thank Jonathan and Stanley for, uh, you know, pretty much making me look really smart with the, uh, um, with the, with the, uh, the abstract and all that sort of stuff. Um, that yeah, Stanley pretty much uh, edited my, um, my abstract almost word for word. It, it's, it's really beautiful. And, the, <laughs> and uh, but anyway, I've been working on this for, uh, for about 30 years. And uh, mostly I just work with the Mel Bay method. Once the students get to hitting all six, then we go into the Julio Sagreras method. And then I use Stanley Yates's two repertoire books from there. The, um, the first page that you see in front of you is just, uh, this is sort of my first attempt at, uh, at just writing off, write, writing out all the stuff that I normally just write in the kids' manuscript books as a supplement to those other books that I use. So uh, Mel Bay and, and all those methods don't really get too much into, actually at all, into uh, improvisation or writing. And uh, that's where the, my notebooks come in for, for students. In some students, their notebooks are, are full of stuff like this. So first page is just um, writing rests, uh, writing, writing whole notes and half notes, quarter notes, how to draw a clef, and all the basic stuff, uh, how to beam, you know, where the stems go up and down. Uh, dynamics and uh, and then just for some fun writing alto clefs and bass clefs and just a little bit of that. I really don't go into that in a lot of depth, but the kids like drawing the notes and it's and it's good fun. Um, and then uh, this is something that a lot of guitarists don't really. Um, uh, there's it's sort of divided. Every time I say that, I start off with teaching a bar chord. Uh, a lot of them say you do what, you know, so this is, um, this all ties into the bar chord is like the perfect hand position, right? So if we, if we well, I have my students put their fingers behind the, the, the neck at first, just to kind of get the bar, because when you, when your hands are out, they're, they're sort of, what do you do with your fingers, you know? Uh, eventually it's, it's easy because you need you just play notes with your fingers but first time through the bar chord is a lot easier if, if you get your fingers behind the fret and uh, and then that's a way of uh, teaching guitar notation that's our um, uh, open strings and the fifth fret bar the a minor seven uh, at 11. Uh, the string uh, the finger numbers the finger uh, the right hand finger numbers it's I'm not an artist, so I guess a, a stick figure hand works good. Um, well, I, I sort of am an artist in, in my own way. Um, uh, flats and, and sharps. And then just just lay it all out in the first page of what the notes are and where they are. OK, then uh, we've learned our we've learned our bar chords and we know our finger numbers. We know the open strings and this, one of the things with hand position here is if we look at one, two, three, and four, um, in the early stages, I like to sort of avoid the part, I don't want to like mention names, but this is in Christopher Parkning's book is this hand position, right? Of complete abduction, right? I, I like to tell my, my students to keep in an adducted position. There, actually, if there, there's a video that I sent in that's probably out there somewhere of me working with, with abduction and adduction. If there's a number of words that I say during every lesson, almost like if, you know, it's adduct, right? Bring your fingers together, right? So this is, uh, so when I, when, I, when I have students play index finger, I have them straighten out their index finger, and then that allows them to adduct fourth finger. This is, um, and then also this goes into another thing that a lot of teachers don't 
really agree with. I don't know why. I, I've had a lot of success with it, but um, is in the first, uh, right, we're going to get to it later, in the EFG exercises, I teach intervals and then hammers and slurs. This is also another thing that um, your fingers really have to be in, in the, the right position to do a proper hammer. So hammer to open, and then hammer, hammer to two, hammer to three, hammer to four. Four takes a little while, but with a little bit of patience, probably after about maybe five or 10 repetitions, they'll get their, their fingers on their fingertips and their fourth finger kind of feeling that thing, that no. But um, it, it just takes patience. If, uh, if a student isn't getting it, getting it right, just stick with them and, and they'll, they'll eventually get this hand position. And this is, this is what I'm after from the very beginning is to kind of get away from that claw, you know, that ad, abduct fingers and and tension in the, in the in all of the digits here to bring always always bring the fingers together and and not abduct and use all those little muscles inside of uh, the hand so um, let me go back and okay rhythm uh, bar lines define a measure of sound and silence through rhythmic subdivisions of sound or notes and rest silence. And sound, I mean, it's a good one syllable uh, thing. It's, a note is a lot more than sound, but it's like, eh, it's, it's a good one syllable way of saying a note is sound and a rest is silence. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a lawyer either, but... <laughs> um, Wow, this is really lonely, like teaching a class like this. I have no idea if uh, I'm just like talking to myself. But you are not. Where I'm, <laughs> there was, I heard something. It's like, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so then uh, time signatures. This is a lot of this sort of stuff is glanced over, and it's, it's like, okay, and on to the actual notes. But it's really kind of fun to work on this with kids where. Uh, or you know whoever is learning guitar is we have our e minor seven we have our a minor seven now it's just a matter of playing whole notes e minor seven a minor seven so we have two three four two three four two three four right and by this time their bar chord is well looking pretty good you know and and once we start getting into the uh teaching the chord progressions and and just you know pretty much the cowboy chords uh, you know da7 and g their hands are sort of in a pretty good position after we've after we've worked on this just for a short amount of time so typically this is uh so then anyway write out a three four measure and then we play we'll we'll write out you know three quarter notes and then go one two And then also, like if you look at, and then of course subdividing half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes. I like to stress strong beats, downbeat, up. You know, sometimes you can kind of forget that it is binary. It's like one, two, three, four. so it's easy to kind of like uh, change those around to somehow get an upstroke on a, on a weak beat. So here is the, right, the first sort of part of the writing. This is the writing the notes of the common time. 87 sixteenths is the, I call that the Stephen Hawking measure, but there's a, uh, that's usually it gets a chuckle out of kids are like, oh, well, 87 beats and, and each of them are 16th. It's like, okay, play. <laughs> um, so anyway, here's uh, the subdivisions of a whole note. So normally this all happens in just one measure. I, I write a whole note and then all you have to do is put a stem on the whole note and that makes room for a half note, right? And then fill in the half note and that makes room for a quarter note. And then uh, I like to teach dots from the very beginning just because 
you know, usually what happens is you get halfway through the method book and they're going, uh, dot, what's that? You know, but, but it really fits in well to the rhythm page. You might as well just cover this stuff from the very beginning. And then, and then continually refresh that and come back to it in each lesson. And then each lesson or progressively, they just sort of, they, they understand what a dot is just because we keep reviewing this rhythm. Um, I like to do, one of my favorite licks is to, you know, and so there's some room in here that the kids write out some of their own rhythms. Sometimes they get it completely wrong, but you know, getting it completely wrong is just a is uh, it's just a way for me to say, well, what if we, you know, all we have to do is change this, and it's right, or you know, and and then they're just um, at some point, they're you know, they're just well, at at this very point, they're writing rhythms. I like to do this one where this is a I turn this into a dotted half, and then a quarter, and then it's, and then. If you divide this in half, it kind of freaks them out because it's like you get two dotted halves and a quarter, and then your rhythm is Metallica. So, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, although, you know, it's like, it, it's I, the older I get, the more they don't really know who Metallica is or anything that I grew up with. But that's okay because it's it's progress, and as long as I have something to teach, whether it's Taylor Swift or the Beatles, it's good by me. Um, let's. Uh, I know Segovia might be up upset with that, but you know, I can't just live my life by his rules. Um, let's see. Okay, good. So anyway, that's that's rhythms. That's uh, you know, uh, also tuplets that we can actually add add, uh, add mul multiple beats, to, and then that all adds into swing rhythms later. And this one, pay, this page paid for my house, or, or actually, probably, hopefully, in a couple of years, my my mortgage will be paid off, and and uh, this has been it. You know, this this was my first teaching gig. And uh, I mean, it's a lot more than it. I've, I've got some very successful students and, and, you know, and, you know, they went on to really good music schools as classical guitarists and all that sort of stuff. But if you were going to actually just say where I make my money, it is um, probably on this page. So this goes, this harkens back to the Alphabeto stuff from uh, what is it, late, late 16th century or, or just 16th century. Uh, of just here's the chords, here's some cool stuff, and uh, there's there's some actual songs in here, but um, you know like La Folia and all of that. And then uh, once we once we've gotten to a certain point, we learn uh, we learn our circle of fifths, we learn uh, uh, harmonic analysis, and then E, F, and G. Where we talked about this before. Um, I like to do whole notes. Um, and rests, just because uh, guitarists are just terrible at rests. It's and it's like and, uh, actually one uh, one of my teachers in, as an undergraduate said, you know, whole notes and rests are the hardest thing to play because they really take concentration. They take you know one two three rest two three two three rest. Uh, whoops, <laughs> it's in four four now, isn't it, Professor? One two three four rest two three four and so on and then our subdivisions come back one two three four one two rest rest one two and then one two and so on and then uh, and then there's just an exercise for the students to work on that it's just something that I wrote out with three notes and then um, writing your own rhythms or, or writing your own you know there's there's uh, this is where this is where I wanted to uh, do this on the board with the class, and it's really cool how it all it all pans out. Is just all it is is do you want E F or G, and what rhythm do you want? So this is rhythm one, rhythm two, rhythm three, 
is in there. No, I didn't write a rhythm three, rhythm four, right? There's it is there, quarter, quarter, half. And then, uh, and then from there, embellishment actually happens on the page. So if, if I take this note and just put a dot here, then make this into quarter note, then, then it also, and then just put a bar here and make this into a half note, then, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, look all that fantastic on the page. It's all spaced wrong, but it's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like, all you need is like a dot and then fill something in and then you, then you have a completely different rhythm. And then eventually the, uh, I like to put in words like hemiola because they're gonna have to know them someday. Actually, yeah, there's actually, there's, if I can di divert a little bit with the story is there's, there's one student of mine that actually had, um, he was like, uh, just a genius. He was like, he could pick up on this stuff really, really quick. And I thought it'd be kind of fun to like, you know, just uh, just do all that. You know, just tell me that John Field invented the nocturne and all this sort of stuff. And, and when it came time for evaluations and all the other teachers were there, I was like, I could pretty much ask him anything. You know, it's like, you know, what's the, you know, what's the, the key signature for E. Dory? <laughs> and maybe it'd be like, uh, okay, you know, just kind of put together all of his, uh, his clefts and, and said, oh yeah, it's, it's however many sharps, you know, I can't even do it that quick. And besides I'm nervous right now, but there's, um, let's see. So anyway, embellishment, further embellishment, and there's just three notes in somewhere. Then of course, write out one a day and uh, with these rhythms, and then um, hopefully they come back and actually do them. But then what we'll do in the lesson is just is just write this one and I'll say practice this for next re week and then write another one for next week. Sometimes they don't do them, sometimes they do them. But either way, they're just, and sometimes they, do, they actually get it completely wrong, but, uh, but at least they're writing notes. And uh, Sometimes students just don't take to writing and that's okay. There's plenty of reading to do and we can, and we can still progress forward. Um, this is where it gets kind of fun and a lot of kids love this, is that if I play the backing track, they can play E, F and G randomly with alternation of index and middle. And uh, it really sounds good. And once, they, once their confidence in their rhythm starts coming through, knowing that no matter what the note they hit is gonna actually gonna sound cool. I can just kind of play this as my backing track. This is where I was gonna hopefully get, get some volunteers during the lecture, but, right. And then, and, and so on, right? So I, I'm playing the backing track, keeping the rhythm simple, playing my whole notes, the, the student is playing E, F, and G, and it sounds really cool. And uh, usually the kids like this. They'll say, it's like, can we warm up with that, with that, that free form thing we did? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, yeah, we can do some improvising. It's great. Um, and uh, that, that's sort of a popular one. Uh, this is, the, actually, this is one where, um, this is where we start going down the jazz route. And this is, I talk, when I, I had a lesson with Jonathan like last year and he kind of floored me. It was just like, he said, yeah, but what about classical improvisation? And I was like, oh, you know what? I don't teach classical improvisation, but now I do. I've been sort of putting through, I've been putting this through the uh, sort of the classical filter and uh, that comes later, but, uh, but, Anyway, let's so anyway, once we have B, C, and D, so yeah, so this year was there was sort of a, a study in classical improvisation, and, and I asked, I, did, I kind of figured out like the, the only, um, it's like the, I, the only people that I can really think of that do like improvisation, like as a part of their, their sort of daily diet. I, granted, there are class, like last year's improvisation team was like awesome. But really, just as a standard, they're almost expected improvisers of the organists, the, the church organists. So I, I started talking to them and they said, a lot of them said just, well, you know, harmonize scales. That's a, that's a big part of it. 
and uh, then I started. So towards the end of the book, I'll show you some of the impro the, uh, the harmonized scales that I put together. And okay, well anyway, we have uh, we have our first we have our C scale now that we have B, C, and D, and then we have our pe arpeggio and our chord progression. So. And then also up in here, I, I like to work on intervals. So by the so if we go back to here, we I, I have I do a little bit of ear training with my students where I play E to F. So that's our minor second, E to F sharp, that's our major second, E to and then minor third and major third, and then go on to do a little bit more ear training once we start the B. And this doesn't take a lot of time. This is maybe like two or three minutes of, uh, of you know, close your eyes. And uh, I can always tell when they're cheating, <laughs> when they're squinting, it's like, no, close your eyes and looking at my guitar so, and for their intervals. But it, then we have our, our perfect fourth, our tritone, perfect fifth, minor sixth. And then we're working on ear training during a lesson. Also, another part of ear training is just tuning play your open E string, they tune their open E string, play your B string, you know, nothing will go wrong. It's just, uh, you know, in the early stages, they might be a little aggressive with just winding the, you know, winding the, the tuner like a top. It's like, ah, slow down, you know? Um, so, um, okay, so here it is. I wrote out a couple of exercises and then uh, I call them skip and step melodies. Uh, I just with half notes, we start with a skip up. And if you skip up, you step down and then go down to here. And then, uh, and then if you skip down, you step up and then, uh, and, and so on. So this is just kind of standard uh, contrary motion. And, uh, and, you know, for every leap, there's a step in the opposite direction, stuff like that. Um, so anyway, I wrote out a simple sort of uh, skip up, step down, step down, step up, skip up, step down, skip up, step down, so on. And then, uh, and then the interpolations, just uh, see, you can, you can either ornament this by, by filling in the space, or you can ornament by doing the, uh, I think ex extrapolation is actually the wrong word. It's like uh, ultrapolation and you know, I have to really kind of get these words right. I apologize for any mistakes in here. This is like a rough draft. I was hoping to talk to a few people before, I did, but I was, but yeah, anyway. So, uh, you know, send your hate letters to, uh, to the White House. Uh, that's not a political joke. I, I you know, anyway. So there's a st skip down, step up, skip up, step down, skip up, right? And, and ultimately, we have a nice little melody. One student at some point said, yeah, but it sounds like a church hymn. And I, and I was like, yeah, you're right. Most church hymns are just uh, just straight up quarter notes. So if you add a, if you add a dot, then it kind of li livens it up a little bit. So, And so on. Um, I've gotten really good at like accompanying melodies in C, <laughs> just because I'm more, this, uh, I work on this all the time. And, and anyway, I don't know if that was any good or not. I, I think I had some boo boos in there. But anyway, so then of course the writing assignment is um, uh, write a skip and step melody each day. So seven spaces, seven strings. And then we have another slur exercise. <laughs> And this harkens back to our hand position that we talked about before. Um, 
knowing your triads. This is uh, this comes from Dennis Chinelli. He said like he, he's uh, he, he's good at like picking fun at like Chuck Wayne's like Bronx accent. <laughs> he's like you don't know your triads. <laughs> how, can, how can you how can you play the guitar and not know your triads? So of course that reminds me of my old teacher. So so anyway, knowing your triads, the we have our we have our tonic triad and uh, a dominant or di uh, diminished. And this uh, and this harkens back to improvisation as well because then it's just a matter of interpolation and knowing those two chords. And of course, that that was this is sort of something new. This is a, this came from um, when Jonathan kind of floored me, saying it's like, well, well, you know, what about classical improvisation? I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, I guess, you know, this uh, this would be essentially um, not too far off from what like Renaissance improvisation would be. Is just uh, one, three, and five major, you know, uh, so. Mm, arguably, I could be, you know, I, but anyway, uh, just a, a triad and simple interpolation is not, you know, that bad. Plus, we can still do it as jazz because um, one, three, five is just, you know, one. It's just, uh, it's all the, all the notes are in there. The 9, the 11, the 13 are just fit into this really well so it's just the key of c so that the students still like to do their free form uh stuff with an with a warm-up and uh anyway we get on to our g open g at this point we have just about every melody that's memorable and uh and i i at this point they can do like I, I like to around this time they're well once they get to g a and b flat they're we're starting to get into the holiday season like october you know they they know their chords pretty well they're they're uh they're um their, uh, their bar chords are pretty good depending on practice, but we, we always kind of hearken back to those old, like, let's, you know, do this. So Beethoven's theme, we have a nice uh, half cadence on D and then a nice full cadence on, uh, on C and then, and then something completely different to G and then uh, on to C for the next thing. And then, uh, then we write a little Beethoven skip and step melody we end on D, we end on C, write something completely different from high G to low G. And then we, um, then we work forward to, um, sorry. And then, uh, and then, you know, I've got to rewrite this. <laughs> I just played through it as like pretty awful. But, and then uh, never forget Twinkle because uh, it's, uh, it's a good one for alternation of index and middle. But I kind of threw it in there because I had an extra, yeah anyway i had an extra line to to use so and then at this point we we write this out and then embellish it and, and then write four more so they have uh, an assignment to do to write out some measures and some stuff like that and then we get into jazz uh, jazz blues now that they know now that they know they're um oh darn it that shouldn't be there but anyway uh, what's an open d but uh, there's, um, so for the teacher, we have uh, this progression, jazz blues progression in, um, in G. So what well, this is, this kind of harkens to their, they know their scale. And then we take out a few notes to make a nice G pentatonic scale. They know their roots. They're, they're actually, they're, they pick up on this really quick. So we're playing in the key of G really well. And uh, and we're also swinging it, and it's great, great fun. Uh, right now, but we're here for our ear training in October. I I wrote this for copyright reason. Yeah, so 
but anyway, hard swing, vivate. Right, but uh, so and actually, you know what? A lot of kids don't even know this anymore. The the um, the, the sort of uh, the old I forget it. Is that it's one of those off? It's Halloween, I think. But anyway, uh, we. Um, we they this goes back to their slur exercises, and then uh, F major because we now have D E and F and we have D minor. I like to avoid the uh, the harmonic and and melodic minor scales in the early stages just because uh, it's just easier to explain. Eventually, we'll just make you know put in our C sharp and our B natural and 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 there we are there we have it. But just in the early stages, I like to just kind of keep it simple, keep it uh, uh, D minor, and and then we have, uh, and then of course we have this, and this is this is where um, uh, Jonathan helped me out a lot with this one. Was uh, just to sort of um, normally the way I teach this is it, now that we have uh, well. I added something new and, and it took me, it took me a little time to sort of, you know, realize that it was really the right way. But, but this is, uh, cause you know, I guess it, you, you get kind of stuck with a groove, you know, and then, and that, that's the way you teach it. And that's not necessarily the truth. It's actually just kind of the way I'm familiar with. So I had never taught species counter point point before as a part of a guitar lesson. And it was just like, well, it really, kind of goes that direction. If we're going to consider classical improvisation, then we're talking about intervals. We're not talking about, and we're, and we're talking about specific rules about uh, seconds and seconds, fourths and sevenths need to be dealt with um, in a specific way, classically. You know, and it's not like jazz where it's like, well, it's not really second, it's a ninth kind of. <laughs> no, and and the, so eventually, so jazz is just a different kind of um, thing, but not really because it's all numbers anyway. But anyway, <laughs> um, there's uh, that's a whole different book. Um, so anyway, we have our uh, we have our whole notes, and then we we uh, we we uh, put our half notes in, uh, and then and then and then ornament with, with quarter notes. And then at this point, we have a, a pretty decent chord progression. And of course, this all harkens back to um, this, uh, the, my mortgage page that is like, you know, we've been working on this all the time. By this time, we're, we've got, we're playing uh, This Land Is Your Land pretty well. We're doing Surf in USA, we're doing, you know, by the time we have our A minor chord, it's like we have like uh, Hey Jude and and uh, you know a bunch of Green Day tunes. It's it's really kind of fun. Some students never progress past this page, and uh, and I kind of it bums me out because they're they're missing out on a whole world of really cool stuff. But if um, but you know, there's people that make their living off of just this page, right? This is this is like, you know, Taylor Swift. And if you can if you can write a decent story, then you can kind of stay with this page. If students never make it past this page, I I insist that they sing, and they'll sing along with me. They'll sing along. They'll they'll work their best with this, and then. Um, and I've had some students really kind of take to this and, and sing some pretty nice songs. Um, and then I, if I can, I don't know how far over I am, but you know, if I can just give you a story, there, there's one time, there's one student in particular that was like kept forgetting her book. And I had a piece of manuscript paper. It's one of those 11 by 17 were on the, the, the cover. You know, there's like four pages of manuscript paper and one open sort of, and uh, and I just kept writing this stuff every week as assignments because she just kept forgetting her book. And the, you know, and uh, by the time the year was over, this this poor piece of this poor manuscript paper, every little every little corner of it was like something was on like written on it. And then uh, and then 
she at some point had dropped it in like a puddle, you know, on a rainy day and it blurred enough that I could actually write other stuff in there. <laughs> so there's just a ton of this stuff. She, she, you know, and, and eventually after, after a, a year, she was like, uh, um, she's proficient and she could sing and she was playing with the blues pop rock band and she could play a nice solo. She was actually just proficient. And uh, then what I was thinking about that is like, well, we didn't even use a method book. We just kind of learned things, you know, here's a blues lick to work on for next week. Here's a, you know, and it was ultimately the manuscript paper that really saved the day. Um, and ultimately she, I think she said she was going to frame that, that piece of paper that was literally her, you know, you know, however many thousands of dollars worth of like, you know, music lessons was on that, like, it is just beautiful. It was, it was cluttered and wonderful. Um, uh, so I, I see Chuck, are we, are we getting time for, uh, all right, and, and then just one thing before I talk to Chuck is, um, or before Chuck um, kind of takes over, is uh, at this point we just start species counterpoint. We have uh, we have our um, we have our whole notes, and the student writes uh, consonants and dissonance above it, or consonants only, and then uh, and then A, B, and C. It goes more, you know, more species counterpoint and more exercises. At this point, once we go to the D string, the A string, and the E string, we're talking baseline only. I, 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 a lot, and that's, uh, oh my goodness, I'm out of time. And, uh, and uh, 12 bar blues, this harkens back to our, uh, our bar chord. And also potentially, this is, this is a really nice slide pattern that I using a slide kind of comes into this one. And then E, F, and G, and then we get into depth with our harmonic and melodic minor scales. Next step is uh, more bass lines. It's our, I still have to write all this stuff out. Passamets, uh, so passamets, so this is gonna be a bunch of uh, ground, uh, uh, ground, Renaissance grounds. This get back, gets back to the essence of classical improvisation, which is, uh, which is uh, Renaissance, it goes right to the Renaissance and, uh, and grounds. And then uh, harmonized scales uh, and a chord progression. Sorry, Chuck. And then one, six, six, two, five, one. And, uh, and then, uh, forgive me on this, uh, you guys will f probably find a ton of mistakes. I just, I, I sort of wrote these out uh, in, my, in, in my pandemic haze. And uh, so then once we start that, we go to the uh, one and then the harmonized scale. So essentially then, and then of course, uh, not to mention uh, French, harm, French, uh, French tabulature and, uh, and reading that. And then uh, usually by the time summer rolls around, they're kind of doing this stuff. So this, this sums up about a year, about nine months in the life of one of my students. Some students uh, progress further, some, people, some students don't, but my mortgage gets paid and I love them all dearly. So anyway, uh, with the exception of like one student. Okay, anyway, everybody, I think we all have that student, don't we? That really kind of like, uh, how do I describe it? That that is really difficult. <laughs> like, uh, like, like, although there's one teacher of mine that said I'd work, probably work really great with kids because I had so much patience, but I've discovered that actually college kids take my patience like way more. <laughs> that is like, the little kids are like, hey, they're kids, let's have fun. You didn't do your homework, come on, let's learn something. <laughs> and, and the college kids are like, uh, do I get an A for this uh, or a B? It's like my cumulative average is going to, oh God, there's patience right there. But anyway, uh, aside from um, <laughs> that has, uh, actually that sort of has everything to do with this, doesn't it? It's, it's uh, I guess, just being a teacher. Okay, Mark, Chuck, we, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going uh, to jump us. Huh? 
Go, go ahead, Mark. I was going to say, I was going to jump us to the Q&A. We, we have a, a number of questions. Uh, folks okay. are jumping at the bits to ask you a few things. Could I talk you into um, I'm turning back to gallery view off of the screen share? Uh, that way I'll be able to follow along with the Q&A. And our education director, Matt Nishimoto, is here as well. Uh, Mark, I got to okay. say, I found, it, I found it fascinating to go from species counterpoint to the mortgage page to the Halloween riff. Um, but, I think, <laughs> but 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 I, I I also have stuck in my head now. Know your triads. <laughs> you don't know your triads. How can you play guitar without knowing your triads? Um, yeah, we did. And we didn't get stuck on fa. So that was personally a, a meaningful <laughs> remark. <laughs> it is. You know, when you're playing the chromatic scale, it's like, isn't the mi fa let down? It, it's a let down. It's, it's going from, uh, you're, you're just kind of cruising along, you know, doing the four or five thing. And then all of a sudden there's like the mi fa, it's like E to F. It's like, oh. And then yeah, you're yeah. back to like four to five. So it's like, awesome. You know, you, you know, working up and have in full, in whole steps, you know? Anyway, yeah. uh, never mind. actually, if you guys get a chance to uh, to watch some of Ted Green's, um, I, do you guys are, are you guys into that? It's like, oh yeah, I, it's like watching him improvise in the style of Bach is just like, oh, that is so. <laughs> it's like you know, and he's just saying, uh, and then and then really under, really like saying exactly that. It, it's all four to five, and, he, and a guy says like, oh, you mean like four or five one? It's like no, four to five. The, the, the one you forget about that. I'm gonna give it's you. Like, a, I'm, I'm gonna yeah, give you. It's kind of jazz, isn't it? Two to five, and uh, anyway. I want to give you a special shout out on that excellent T-shirt you're wearing as well. So oh I'm yeah, gonna, look at that. I'm, I'm gonna read the the first question. I think it might have been one of the first ones that was in, but it's from uh, David Isaacs. He says, "Hi, Mark. Thank you for sharing your teaching style with us." Starting with bar chords and slurs is pretty radical. Um, can you address how a teacher might deal with excessive left-hand tension uh, when starting this way? Uh, use your back muscles. Like uh, a lot of times the students, they'll, um, the, the, they'll get into the uh, sort of my, my hand is a, is a massive spring that can never be injured, <laughs> right? So be smart, right? You, you, the guitar is here being held in position. The, uh, I'm not using my thumb, but I'm using, but I'm, but I'm actually, uh, I, actually one of the things that I, I tell my students to do is to, um, I tell them, try to break the guitar in half. Try to have so much pressure, you know, not pressure, um, so much leverage on this side, right? And so much, you know, like holding the guitar in a good position here and just try to break it in half, right? And there's their bar chord. If uh, another thing, tension is also, it's, um, and, and also this, this um, starting off with bar chords. Yeah, if, if your fingers are out playing the bar chord, it's easy to kind of get a little bit of a, little bit of a kind of hurt in, in your, in this, right? If your fingers are behind the chord, your hand is in a, you're in a really nice position, right? So. And uh, all this comes from uh, Pat O'Brien. He was, uh, he was, uh, he, I had a lot of hand tension. I had the, uh, I, you know, I, I learned from the Parkening book and this is right in his book. This finger goes way over here like this. This finger goes way over here like this and let's all be men and, <laughs> right? But with him, it was all about the same thing that I tell my students, adduct, bring your, bring your fingers together, your hand, is, your hand is relaxed, right? If you spread your fingers apart, you're using a ton of muscles in here, right? That just don't need to be used. If you relax them, you can actually get, like if, if you take, like look at, um, if you look at, like my fingers, right? If I try to push my fingers as far apart as I can using my abductors, right? All I get is like a finger's distance, right? And my, and my hand hurts, so don't do that, right? If I relax my fingers, I can essentially bring my fingers this far apart. It doesn't hurt, right? I'm actually just using the sort of 
flexibility of my fingers. And actually right now it feels like just a really nice stretch. This stretch can happen on your guitar if you just don't use your abductors. And all you have to do is relax and get a way bigger, you know. So this is about, you know, if there's pain, there's usually tension and this is tension, right? So, I mean, that's sort of the easy answer. And that's, you know, this is sort of, uh, <laughs> this, this is me in New York City studying with Pat and, and like, oh crap, I've got to do a master's recital and I'm like rebuilding, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? And adduction, right? Right, and then, uh, and then ultimately, you know, the nice thing is, is uh, I never got the master's degree, but you know, my hands don't hurt. So, Good point. you know, th there's, uh, and now I'm, I'm at 100%, I'm playing my Theorbo, I'm playing a bunch of really cool stuff. And I got a whole bucket load of students. So it sort of turned out okay. Here's a question from Blythe Emler. When your students are learning new rhythms, do you have your students count out loud? And if so, what verbalization do you prefer to use? The old one in the enda or a one to teta or another system? Or do you have them verbalize like at the eighth note or at the 16th note level? Yeah, this is, that's a good question. The, my, um, one of my colleagues, uh, Tim Urban, he runs the uh, ear training program. He's, he's actually my duet, my duet partner. He's in my, uh, when I, I play early music with him, we do a lot of early childhood stuff. That's a real play. If you guys ever get a chance to do like early childhood work, it's so fun. It's like, it, but, you know, cause showing off like lutes and stuff like that. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? The question was just about how to verbalize rhythms or what system, you know, do you use the, the one enda or the one potato? Ada. We uh, we he was he was rewriting a, a a theory book for one school, right? They wanted to update it, and you know, and uh, we he asked me that same question. He said, "What do you teach?" And I was like, uh, "I teach like one and two and, and then one e and uh," but I never really go that in depth to it. Eventually, they get it, and it's oh yeah, it's a subdivision, and and I, we don't really count it that way. Um, I, I like to clap my rhythms with my students first in the, um, a, before we start. And I also like to work in small sections. Like, like um, I don't let my students, hang, you know, like butcher like 10 measures in a row before I start. <laughs> it's like two measures, clap the rhythm and then, and then master those two measures, go on to the next two, and we just keep doing that. And then eventually it sinks in and, the, and, and for the most part, um, depending on, the, I mean, depending on the student, there's, I have one student right now that really, uh, but then it's, it's also like uh, he has, he's on a certain, um, he's kind of on a, on a certain level, the autism spectrum, spectrum that he just, that, that it's, um, that I just have to kind of repeat it, say, well, let's try this again, let's try this rhythm. And then we kind of keep going back, but we also keep going forward because he can read anything. He just can't do any rhythm. <laughs> so, Follow-up question from our same attendee. Do you present the material to students in a, in a classroom group setting or just for individual private lessons? You know, both, yeah. either or. Yeah, the, this is my first year. Uh, well, it's not my first year of teaching a, a college class. I've, I've taught them before, and I usually don't like them. I, I usually don't like teaching to them. But then this year, I sort of had a... And this, this kind of goes back. I, I've been sort of working with GFA and, and talking, to, uh, talking to a lot of the professors that work with college kids. I sort of understand them a little bit better now. So I had a really good semester. I taught a class guitar one and then, uh, and then a class guitar two. There was uh, nine students in each class. And, uh, and it went a little slower because I kind of like to, uh, I kind of like to uh, kind of get it learned and get it and get on with it, go, go on to the next thing. And then, so I kind of pride myself on being able to like present a lot of material, a lot of, you know, and, uh, and then and teaching college kids, like I said, is a, I guess it just takes a different kind of patience than it does 
uh, teaching like kids. For me, it's like, I don't really, they don't really try my patience. Maybe when they get sort of high school age and stuff, but but even, you know, it's like some of the, like boys in middle school, they, they, I mean, they're just kind of, uh, I don't know what to call it. But. I, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for you, but I will say from my own experience, I'm, you know, I, I find the younger they are, the more of kind of a sponge they are for learning. And really from my own experience, as I got older, I, I recognized what was difficult and, you know, I kind of placed my own boundaries on learning. Oh, this is, this is hard kind of thing uh, as compared <laughs> to the young learner. That's just bring it on. Oh, right. Yeah. And, you know, it's like in my early years, like up for the first like 10 years of teaching, maybe like 15, I just really didn't like teaching like five and six year olds. It's just like, Oh God, you know, this is this longest half hour of my life. And I, and I'm never going to, you know, it's like that, that half hour just ticks on forever. But, you know, it's like, once I started really understanding like what a five and six year old, I mean, it's really fun. You know, and it's like, you know, the parents are there and we're all like having fun and, and, uh, and, but then uh, I guess the older I got, the, the more, you know, I guess, I, I guess I'm just mellowing with age. Right so, well, we, we all do. That's, <laughs> a, uh, that's a really good segue. Our, our, our education director, uh, Matt Nishimoto was in here with us, but we had a little technical difficulty. So he sent me the question and, and it plays perfectly into what you just said. A theme in today's education track has been fun or student interest. In our education happy hour, we had a long discussion of connecting with students where they're at. Uh, what role does, what role could this approach play towards this end? Fun. Um, yeah, you know what, you lost me in there somewhere. I got to, but you know what, fun with, uh, fun with students. I guess it's, it's fun, but I have a job to do, you know, it's like, um if finding that balance right yeah i guess it's uh it's 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 a kind of like a it's if like it's i got kind of a a strange relationship with school is i hate school <laughs> i really do I, ever since i was a kid just wow oh, god get me out of school you know and then uh but i love learning like just cannot get enough learning i can't get enough like uh his like even if it's just like history channel like like uh like just you know like just and and it's and that's like that show with like uh on the brain with david eagleman the eagleman just understanding how our brains work and how it fits into my guitar playing and how it you know and uh and then and then talking with jonathan about you know, and then, you know, it's in a, and all he had to do is say like, well, what about classical improvisation? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> that, that is a whole nother branch. I had never even like, you know, because when I, I always thought of improvisation as something that was, even though uh, I want to, um, oh, I'm really diverting. But anyway, when I was in grad school, I wanted to learn how, I heard you know, like Francesco da Milano could was known as an improviser, right? And I was thinking, how did he improvise that? <laughs> and now it's just like, yeah, I get it. It's just it's just species counterpoint. It's just uh, it's just intervals. It's consonants and dis dissonance. And uh, and then if you harken back to like 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 Joe Pasta has a great live album that you can you can tell that some of it is all kind of put together like he really took some time to kind of put it together and then there's other parts that are like okay here's my formulas i'm going to i'm going to go to that part and then ultimately come back to that cool thing that i put together and thought about so improvisation um, it's like it's like language it's like uh context it's uh like, I know what egg salad means. I got it memorized. I've known it for a long time. But once you say I slipped on egg salad, it's a whole different, <laughs> like, right? And then sure. there's like, I had egg salad for breakfast, you know, or I, you know, it's, it's so improvisation is just a whole bunch of, uh, you know, like, like improvising to La Folia. 
I guess like, another good uh, analogy would be if you never had an egg salad sandwich, but you were you were reading that word for the first time as compared to, you know, you had already eaten egg salad and you, you tasted it, you smelled it, you knew what it was, and then you learned the word. Right, and then slipped on it later. <laughs> so, right, so, or, you know, so we have A, A, we have A. Uh, oh, God. So it's eight, eight, three, 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 by the right. So once you start doing the turns and all that sort of stuff, it's like, yeah, it's just uh, then it's using language, right? Right, it's just eight three eight three eight three, you know. And, and, but it, but it's like uh, once you start interpolating and and all of that, then 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 your uh, then your improvisations just kind of grows from just knowing the baseline. And that's where I really, gosh, I, I've got to talk with him. Like uh, I don't know if Jonathan is there or not, but in, in the audience. But uh, but I, I got to take a lesson with him at some point because I've got a bunch of questions. So, and, and anyway, like, even though I'm this, uh, you know, I've been teaching for years and, and all that sort of stuff, I, I kind of had the Doc Severinsen uh, thing that I don't think you ever stop being a student. I think I, no matter what, you know, th there's always a master to go to that you can, um, you know, that, that you say, what about this? And sometimes at some point it just becomes a colleague. <laughs> it's like, what, you know, of, of like where we were talking about the one Iana, two Iana thing half the faculty um, in that case, uh, everybody had a different method for that. And they're all sure. very successful teachers. They got like award winners and all the whole thing, you know? So whether or not it's a standard one N, two N or one Iana, two Iana, it's like, uh, yeah, the, there's a clarinet player that, that's like his students are always winning competitions and stuff like that. And he goes, ah, I just go da, 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 you know? <laughs> and then well, they works, get it works. And, and it works, right? And I can't refute it because his students are like incredibly good. I'm gonna I'm gonna squeeze in one final question. Uh, and that's from Cesar Torres Mendez. How long did it take you to put together a learning plan like this? Thirty years. Hmm. I've been teaching. Um, it doesn't all happen at once. This is like uh, uh, actually over thirty years. So the, 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 it's been. Um, I, I did. I started teaching in um, music. Actually, you know what? It's even. It's probably more like thirty-five. There's a you know that first guitar pedagogy class that I had with Chris Cation. <laughs> he said, "Okay, teach me a D chord," and I'd be. And I was like, uh, <laughs> "Well, you kind of do it. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, you know, your finger. Your this finger goes to this place, and this right before you know it, you're." Um, you're sweating it out just trying to describe how to play a d chord and even even then every so often for my students i, I just tell them to do that i said you know teach teach me how to do a, a d a7 and g and put them in my shoes and uh it's amazing because they they, they you know they, it, i love that sort of as they're as they're as they're as they're spinning to kind of sweat it out to like tell me they're uh um have to describe what they already know how to do actually you know pat o'brien had a great he said um it's it's um this is one of those sort of i could show you how to do it but to really describe how to do it is tough this is like um uh technical writing right he had a friend that was like a, a technical writer at, at mit and he, his first assignment to his students was write a paragraph on what a paper clip Right, you know, write, write a paragraph about a paper clip. And, you know, visually, you could just hold two pieces together and go paper clip, right? But then uh, the students really have to kind of sweat it out to really describe what a paper clip is. It's um, the creative mind. Uh, daunting. <laughs> but then that's, that's, that's sort of that's when I think of like my early years of teaching, and then 30 years later, it's like, oh, yeah, it's easy. Just, uh, and then, you know, 10 years Life. later, they win awards and stuff.
lifelong learning. That's the that's the difference. Mark, I want to I want to thank you for spending this time with us, sharing this this wealth of of, of experience, thirty years of experience with us, uh, and we really appreciate you being with us at the at the GFA today. Thanks a lot, Mark. Oh, thank you guys so much. It it means a lot for me to be here. It's been great. Folks, we'll continue now. We have the next session up next. We'll see you in the Q&A on the backside. Thanks again. Hello to all my GFA friends and guitar family. A special shout out to my Woodring family if you're watching. It is an honor to be a part of this year's online GFA festival and I hope you're enjoying it. I want to welcome you guys to the Woodring guitar shop that we built two years ago. It's brand new and I've been really enjoying building guitars in here. We also get to host concerts and master classes and I can't wait to resume doing that once we start getting to a more normalcy in life again. As you can see, I've been pretty busy building commissions, which is pretty awesome to have right now. And hopefully start some new ones in this fall. If you have any, informa uh, any questions or want more information about my guitars, please visit my website at woodringguitars.com. And in the meantime, I want you guys to just stay healthy and safe, and I hope to see many of you soon. And I look forward to the 2021 GFA in Fullerton, California. Take care, everyone. Here in Maine, we have real long winters and we spend months looking forward to when spring finally comes. We've been spending a lot of time in the garden, growing food, planting things. Everybody's doing some kind of creative project or working on new things. I'm Toby Jepka. I make concert classical guitars here in Portland, Maine. I use a lot of instinct in my guitar making and obviously listen to my ear. 
They also do a lot of scientific testing and data gathering. I'm looking for power and projection, clarity in terms of harmony and chord, articulation and tone color. I'm looking for resonance. I want to feel that cathedral-like sound. I want you to feel like you're playing effortlessly and that the sound is just pouring out of the instrument under your fingers. And that's the criteria that I judge guitars by more than any other. The first guitar I have for sale is a 2020 Camatillo Rosewood and European Spruce 650 with an elevated fingerboard and an all wood lattice bracing. I love working with Camatillo Rosewood. It's very difficult to get, it grows in Southern Mexico, but it has an incredibly rich purplish red visual tone to it and tends to make a very powerful and crisp guitar. The next guitar I have for sale is a 2020 Quilted Maple and European Spruce X-Brace guitar, also 650 millimeters, with an elevated fingerboard. The Quilted Maple is framed by African Blackwood. This guitar has a very refined sound, sort of lute-like quality to the trebles that I love. The third guitar I have for sale is a Camatillo Rosewood Western Red Cedar 650 with a traditional fingerboard. This guitar is a powerful guitar with good balance. It's got rounded trebles and articulate bases.
Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar here on best practices in the guitar classroom. My name is Steve Eccles, and I've been teaching here at Flathead High School and Glacier High School since 2000. So I've been here 20 years, and every year I do my best to improve and, and make things better. Every school is unique, of course. My school is not going to be uh, the same exactly as yours, but there are some general overall principles that I'm excited to share with you. And in particular, now this is 2020 and it's during the year of our pandemic, which has changed things a lot. And so I wanted to start off uh, not with just some interesting guitaristic or music theory point, but the point of not ignoring the times that we're in and acknowledging what's going on uh, historically and seeing how we can uh, fulfill the needs of our students, not only as guitar players, but as human beings. And at the same time, uh, improve our own situation. So what we have been doing at our school through trial and error is we're using um, Google Classroom. Some of you are familiar with that or you may use something different. And what I found is that if I broke my unit into three different sections, one would consist of the performance piece, another would consist of listening, and another would consist of music theory, which would include um, intervals, scales, triads, and so forth. And at the end of the three weeks, uh, that would be considered the unit. Um, nonetheless, we also found that it's important to have grades coming in uh, on a weekly basis uh, to create some incentive. Uh, however, the jury is still out on exactly how um, effective that was. So one particular assignment would be to look at a document like this, and it, it has here uh, 20 different secrets from the science of happiness. And I also would like to do this for myself as well as the uh, students. So at our school, every class uh, teaches uh, reading and every class teaches writing and every class also teaches how to read diagrams and so forth. Of course, the guitar is a built-in diagram, so we've got it made in that category. But take, if you take a look at a couple of these, find the opportunity in a challenging situation. Value yourself. I, in the pandemic, I finally got one of those gadgets. Uh, make happiness a goal. Start your day by taking the focus off of yourself. Speak cheerfully and respectfully to others. Increase your awareness of small pleasures. Taste of carrot juice. Enjoy community. Dress in a way that makes you feel good. Eat healthy foods slowly, go to bed early, learn new things, spend time in nature, exercise, take breaks from the news, keep inspirational reading close at hand, do something every day just for yourself, and that could include guitar playing. When faced with negativity, don't react, spend time with upbeat people, find benefits in setbacks, never blame or shame, Mistakes happen, apologize and move on. Acknowledge the positive of others, help out, share stories and celebrate being here. Sing, dance and play. So that would be uh, one example of part of the three part unit. Uh, here is another one. Can you see this okay? I hope so. Make it a little bigger. Oops, I want to make the whole thing a little bigger. Here's one called uh, I Nailed It. 
And the idea is when the pandemic is over and you're looking back 10 years from the future and you can say, I nailed it. What did you do to actually nail it? And I actually took this from something I saw on public TV. I can't take full credit for you for it. But if you were ever going to be a Michelangelo or a genius in music or art, for students who are working at home, now is your chance to specialize and really develop. So the question is, what new skills did I develop? What new directions did I take? What new personal relationships did I start? What did I make or create? How did I help or serve others? What habits positive did I form? How did I mature as a human being? What books did I purchase or read? What stories or poems or articles did I write? How did I adjust my professional goals? How did I make money or prepare to make money? Who are my new role models and mentors? How did I interact or not with technology? And what spiritual revelations have as the uh, pandemic uh, given to me? And those kind of thoughts, I think, separate the artist from the technician. Uh, the artist is going to think, uh, in terms of the um, philosophical. Here's Steve, another. I, Steve, I don't want to interrupt your flow, but I think the, the screen share may be stuck on number seven um, from the four happiness. Um, you might want to unshare and reshare. Stop share. Share screen. And inquiry learning. Can you see that? Okay. I hope so. Yep, inquiry learning. Now we're getting into best practices and this is some really good 21st century stuff, but the students don't do it automatically. Uh, they need a chance to hear it, digest it, and to practice it. And here, here are the points and you can agree. As a student, I'm encouraged to find my own information. We build learning adventures on my existing knowledge. Learning is student-centered. I am proactive. I independently schedule time for contemplation, practice, creative work. I am encouraged to ask academic questions. I do not depend on the teacher for everything. I work with my teacher as a learning partner. In order to interact with the instructor online, I demonstrate works in progress, meaning that the works do not have to be finished. Sometimes students think, well, they have to finish something before they can demonstrate it. Well, wouldn't it be better, in my opinion, to demonstrate two measures, four measures, than nothing? Uh, I continue to make improvements over time by keeping my work as part of a practice playlist. In other words, I do not start something and then just casually drop it. To the extent that I can, I pick things that are gonna grow like a tree planted by the river. I know how and when to challenge classroom assumptions. So there's uh, one of the aspects of a unit, oops, Screen sharing has stopped. Well, I'll share it again. Go back here. Excuse me. I'm going to move this over here. Find out what I'm going to share next. From here, I'm going to go uh, into some music theory. And for many years, I have asked the question, how can I improve the way I teach rhythm? And let's take a look at something here. Uh, start up the finale here. There it is. And I'm going to uh, share that. <clears throat> now let's start again here.
Oh, I think it's got a green mark around it. Can everybody see that okay? No value comparison. Value comparison. Uh, nothing too dramatic about that. But here's the fun part. I learned from the drum teacher. Excuse me. And uh, here's just a little bit of practical stuff from a professional. <laughs> this is a Ramirez guitar. It's an heirloom that my beloved father of blessed memory bought for me. And we bought it on mail. And it's too big and too loud. And I, it would hurt to play it and I was going to sell it. But then I was asked to play at a dude ranch and they didn't want any amplifier. And they needed a guitar that was going to be loud. Lo and behold, uh, the Ramirez comes to the rescue. Now you will notice not one, but two capos. This is my default playing position with the capo on the second fret. The guitar has a better sound. It projects better. It's easier to play and it fits better. So just a little aside, my little secret maybe that'll help someone out there i think it's kind of cool two capos one from each direction but i digress back to the note value uh, comparison what's interesting uh the way a drum teacher uh can teach things like this they would you could start with uh just tapping the whole note like this two three four with one hand two, three, four, tap the half note with the other hand, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, two. And you can combine these different rhythms using both hands. Let's try four and three. You can imagine uh, the fun you can have uh, assigning different uh, groups to different uh, rhythms. In addition to playing with the, the two hands, you can have different individual groups. Group one, play this, group two, play this, and get a layered composite rhythm that would define how to groove. So I love this page. Uh, it doesn't look like much, uh, but I always like to remind students that strum uh, rhymes with drum and uh, that we have a lot in common uh, with drummers. In fact, when I'm playing at the Dude Ranch without an amplifier, it's kind of funny. I actually flash back to the kid who played too loud in my class all the time, and I'd always be telling him to play quieter. And, uh, but now I really, I really bang the heck out of it, and believe it or not, you can hear it in a fairly noisy room. Uh, but it's not the gentle, sweet uh, Segovia sound that uh, I would have started with. Well, let's uh, let's go to another one. Let's see here, uh, same man. And uh, oops, screen sharing stopped. I'm going to share with you again something else here, and this is called my gigantic staff. Now that is definitely a gigantic staff and I'll even blow it up a little bigger. Now, in my class, get these out of the way here. My uh, hit screen share. There we go. In my class, my goal is to get the students playing music as soon as possible to get that positive feedback. And so I do not adhere to um, any prejudices against various teaching uh, techniques. Uh, what I'm trying to say is within the last couple of years, I have become familiar with alpha notes. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with alpha notes, but with an alpha note, 
you put in a, uh, a note with an alphabet letter instead of the note head. And so when, you're, when I'm doing exercises with my students at the beginning, uh, we, can, we can use an alpha note. So for example, let's say I put that note in there on a C. And if I go up to the plugins, if you haven't seen this before, plugins, you just select alpha notes. Oh, it must select a region. Sorry about that. Plugins, alpha notes. And the note C uh, goes in there. Kind of, kind of groovy. Uh, it it re removes a step for the students. And I, um, I've only had a couple of students who preferred not to use the alpha notes, but I have become a friend of using them not only with finale, but just students with a pencil. One of these things, for those of you who don't know, complete with eraser or even better. Remember in the 19th century, this was technology, nice pencil factory, um, still is in my opinion. Uh, so anyway, there's the, uh, the gigantic staff, let that go away. And I'm gonna pull up another one. You can't have a guitar class without teaching chords. Is screen sharing still on? No, it says pause, doesn't it? So, uh, stop, share, share screen, chord spelling, and on. And you will see here the 17 natural notes written with alpha notes. And I also have Montana tablature underneath here. Um, some of you know that this is referred to by other people in the southern part of the country as Cuban tablature, but Cuban tablature uh, has the string on top of the fret. And all, for the way my mind works and the way I've been doing it on all of my documents is the other way. This, this here would be first fret on first string. This here would be three on one. So in order to not cause confusion with my good uh, colleague, Bill Swick and others uh, in uh, Nevada, I'm calling this Montana tablature because uh, we're, we're in a different world up here. Uh, the point with the chords here is if a student can finger a chord in advance like C, I can then point to different notes and they can read the notes, and I love this, without moving their left hand. You know, I can say play low C, E, low E, G. So reading music with only having to move one hand, uh, so we're, we're doing two things at once. It's a compound exercise, not only learning the chord, but also learning the notes at the same time. I would also add that it seems to me that it's worthwhile to be able to take pieces of the chord and apply those pieces to a warm up. For example, the C chord, instead of playing the whole chord, why not just play this? Do, re, mi, one, two, three, one, two, three. Teach an interval theory and then take that little two note chord, play it long to two note, play it. Transversal, play it with an anchor finger if you want. is easier than one. You could take these two notes of the C chord, teach the interval of a six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, six.
and I kind of refer to that as just kind of walking across the uh, fingerboard there. So that's, uh, that's what excites me about this way of teaching chords is to combine chords and chord spelling and intervals uh, all at the same time. Put that away. And let's talk about playing a melody. And um, give me just a moment and I'll have this uh, blown up for you. Share screen, let it be duo, share. For many years, uh, on the various different musics that I would present to my students, I did not put in the lyrics. But with the wisdom of age, I realized the lyrics play an extremely important role. If the students can sing or recite the lyrics, that makes the, the lyrics and the music self-referential. The students know when they're playing it right and they know where they are because they can match the music with the lyric. So any song that I do or I've done in the last couple of years that has words always has the lyrics in there. It also gives you a chance to talk about singing and the voice. And if you're a certified music teacher and you have a chance to speak about the voice, I would highly recommend it. Uh, I, I won't, go, won't go into any other lecture other than to say that the voice is very, very important and your ability to speak and communicate clearly uh, has many advantages that I won't go into. So now look at this simple arrangement of let it be. I can demonstrate it the first time through. The second time through, I can have the students simply recite the chord names and follow the music. Their ability to follow the beat is a legitimate skill. So I'm playing and they're gonna just recite C, G, A minor, F. They can take it to the next step further. Find the root of the C, the root of the G, the root of the A, the root of the F. Everybody, we're going to play just the roots this time. Ready, go. C, G, A, F. Then your class can split. Students who are unable to play the chords can play the bass. As we all know, the world needs more bass players. In fact, we ordered two acoustic basses for my classroom this year, and it's a lot of enthusiasm for those basses. I want two more. So we have one group of students playing the chord, one group playing the bass, so forth. Now you'll notice I have used alpha notes and I would go back and I will would have demonstrated to my, my students and we would have warmed up on the 17 natural notes and I love to do this and I'll show it to you here in just a minute. Uh, oh, it's, uh, didn't get in my cue there but I've got a beautiful diagram of the 17 natural notes and using a laser pointer, we can play the scale and then I can point to the notes and let it be as they are in the scale rather than just having them play the music straight away. So they can see that these notes are derived from the parent scale. And so then the question is, how do we approach it? My view is, 
and I'll use a Montana uh, reference, is that if we get some snow six, eight inches out there, I can trudge through that snow and it's gonna be hard to trudge through it every time, or I can shovel it and then I'll be able to walk through. The metaphor here is for the students to memorize two measures a day. Day one. And then of course, if they can do more than you've assigned, that makes them feel very smart. Um, but the goal is to uh, really learn the music or what I say is to overlearn the music. And the idea of sight reading is not what they're doing. They're really using the notes as a way to learn the music and as a way to recall what they've learned. Sight reading is a skill that will come later on and it's at a much higher level. And we don't wanna confuse sight reading with what they're doing. A more advanced student will get a, a thrill out of playing the harmony. And then the really gifted student is excited to play the two together. And if they want to, if you want to keep feeding them a challenge, the advanced student plays the root and the melody. flow, I do think it's important to actually teach the concept of flow. I mentioned earlier that uh, this was the first year I ever got one of these gadgets. I held off for philosophical reasons. I thought, ah, my body's my temple. I don't want to be wired. Of course, no, I love being wired. <laughs> but I had it in my pocket at a music department meeting and it rang in my pocket and I turned it off. And for the whole rest of the meeting, I was wondering who had called me and waiting for when I could call them back. I couldn't concentrate on the meeting. I was staring there like a deer in the headlights. Have you ever had students just kind of staring? They're waiting to run out and check their phone. So the best place for this is in the car or the locker. Unless you have more discipline. I'm behind the times. Maybe more enlightened people can keep it in their pocket. But I tell you what. I had a hard time concentrating in that, that faculty meeting, knowing that someone thought I was important enough to call. But I digress. Forgive me. Let me show you something called a mile a minute. This uh, concept of a mile a minute is um, a concept of just good education. Uh, other teachers use it with different concepts and so forth. We take a look here. You've got the first six notes. We've got Montana tablature here. And then we've got the no hits. Notice it's as jumbo as I can make it. Jumbo is easy. Small is complex. 
So we've got approximately 60 notes. Uh, 60, excuse me, let's differentiate that. Uh, 60 notes, but only six pitches. And with the timer, you uh, time the students and let them either spell them F E F E D E D C D C B C B C D C, or put the Montana tablature above the notes, either one. What's great about this is that it does not require a lot of stamina. Most students have an attention span of at least one. <laughs> a little humor in there. <laughs> at least one minute. <laughs> Actually, I think they can go two or three. Um, and then the idea is that you mark approximate. Well, today on Tuesday, I got the counter, I got 50% of the notes. On Wednesday, you do it again. And you do it again, and you get faster. And it's always kind of fun because there's always a couple of students who've had piano lessons or something. And they could do all of them. It's kind of fun to find that out. Now, I stumbled a minute ago with the word pitch and notes. And I want to return to that for a second. Because this is one of the most huge breakthroughs I've had. And my students have had it too. And that is to determine how many actual pitches are in a song versus how many notes? This is, this is, look at all those notes. There are 60 of them, one per second. Oh my gosh, that's so hard. How many pitches? Only six pitches. So there's a lot of repetition. If we were doing let it be, for example, I would say to the students, Count, how many notes are there from measure one to the end? 52. How many pitches? One, two, three, four, five, six. Still six, seven. In the whole A section of let it be, only seven pitches. So my students are quietly relieved to make this differentiation. Oh, man, it looks like rocket science, but there's only six pitches. And uh, it brings a lot of uh, a nice sense of peace to my classroom. It's like, no, no, no worries. You can also have students circle these in groups of three or two, depending on the way their eye works. F-E, F-E-D, E-D-C. So we start to learn to read in groups. We never read rhythm one note at a time. We read rhythm as part of a pie, part of a graph. Same thing with notes. So my students, I will ask them to circle these. I will ask them how many pitches there are and actually how many notes there are. And by golly, if it doesn't work. And in my little collection here, I've got these uh, all, all ready uh, to go. And I won't give you a shameless commercial on that, uh, but um, if you're interested, I can tell you where to get them later. You can just email me at guitarmusicman.com. So how are you going to teach jazz chords? You have some real kind of cool, groovy way of teaching jazz chords. Well, let's take a look at one of my favorite songs uh, for doing that. Stop sharing. Share screen. Black Magic Woman. And it's not an accident to pick this song. It's a Excellent song. The melody itself provides students with the opportunity to learn parent scale for improvising. 
course, I've got my capo on. Santana, learn the melody to Black Magic Woman and then scramble those notes. job of paraphrasing the melody there but that would be a subject for another another topic uh, what's neat about a song like this is that you only have three chords one four and a five chord and the students can ingrain just one of the chords so for example the a minor and then play the rest of the song using their traditional beginning chords, the D minor or the Spanish D minor, D7. So you only have to learn one new chord at a time. Hallelujah. Uh, So there you have it, and I've got uh, half a dozen of these kind of arrangements that include the melody. It includes the chords here at the beginning with tablature, and uh, we use uh, different methods to ingrain those chords. Uh, keep my eye on the clock here, but for example, with the A minor, you can ingrain it by playing chromatic sequence. You can ingrain it by playing it on the natural notes. I'm going to pretend that's an F, G, A, B, C, D. You can ingrain it with the cycle of fourths, A, B, G, C, cycle of fifths, and uh, but it's just one chord, but you really get to overlearn it, put it into muscle memory, and then and still play the song because you've got the beginning chords. By the way, isn't that cool? The Spanish D minor and the E7 are exactly the same fingering. There's Mr. Chuck. He's popping up there, which means it must be time for questions. I'll set my guitar over here. Uh, so I'm going to hit stop share, I guess, and uh, go back to this picture of these wonderful smiling faces. I like this. I think this is uh, pretty cool. Uh, there's some advantages to having learned how to navigate the digital world, wouldn't you say, Chuck? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and Steve, I just got to say, you're the you're the coolest cat, man. Thank you for for doing this today. I want to take a moment and do a do a plug of. A, a great resource that I've um, turned to usually about once a month for the last, I can't think how many years, but your NAFME publication from You'll Have to Help Me with what year you did that, but Teaching Classroom Guitar, I think of it as my big green book, which I have to admit right now is still stuck in my office uh, where I haven't been in a long time. Uh, so feeling a little weird without having my Teaching Classroom Guitar book by Steve Eccles. But Steve, when did you do that book? And is that is that still available? It's still available uh, through uh, Roman and Littlefield publications. I think they print them on demand. Uh, and um, some of the things are, you know, there's a picture of a overhead projector in there and some, it's, you know, it's a little bit dated, but if you become a good speed reader, you can still find some great pearls in there. So there are definitely some pearls. Uh, I recommend, of course, I speed read a, a lot of things. Uh, 
about everything. The, yeah. the world needs more bass players. That was one of the one of the notes one of the notes I took. Uh, your your list of um, the inquiry learning that yeah. that was just fabulous. And um, I think we forget maybe the power of, of positivity and how much impact that has on the, the lesson. Yeah. Yeah, it's like how to learn. I can you know sit there and you know pour out all kinds of information, but let's get psyched up about lifelong learning. You know, it's it's a high, and I would like to demonstrate that if I can. Having a fun flashback here of when you and I uh, did an ensemble festival together, and we were alternating uh, working with the ensembles. And, uh, you know, I, I thought I was holding my own ground until you popped up there and started uh, uh, improvising a poetry for the ensembles. And that was before the harmonica came out of the pocket. But, but I digress. Folks, uh, uh, we've just had a wonderful session. Uh, from Steve Eccles on best practices in classroom guitar. If you're joining us uh, through the YouTube, Facebook, or a GFA a website uh, for the stream, I'd encourage you to join us on Zoom for the question and answer session. Uh, we have a, a number of questions already loaded, uh, so I'd like to, to jump right to them. I will say that we're also joined here by our GFA Director of Education, Dr. Matthew Nishimoto, and I'm going to fire off a question from Blythe Emler. How do you approach formative and summative ass assessment in your classes? Do you use playing tests? And if so, what type do you use? How frequently do you administer? And what is your preferred format for students to demonstrate their progress? That's a big one, Steve. That is a very big question. And the uh, formative uh, assessment is done by circulating through the room and watching. It's, it's not extremely uh, formal uh, in terms of what they're doing. So people will say to me, when's the test? And I say, right now. And so I'm, I'm watching uh, as they go. I also uh, use a lot of paper. You remember the gigantic staff that I showed? We can tell you know, a certain amount about a student's understanding by their ability to write and do some of the written exercises. So you can dream them up. Those gigantic staffs can also be uh, converted into chord diagrams uh, as well. So we, I didn't do a whole, didn't queue up a lot of uh, different writing things, but you have to be creative and I'd say, we do a little bit of writing each day. And so I get a big stack of little, little papers. And the uh, summative assessment is an interesting one. And that's, uh, I do not do what some of the teachers do. Uh, and that's to sit and have everybody play in front of the class. I, I go around and I listen to them again. I see where they are. And um, that's it. They get a grade as being uh, proficient, approaching proficient, uh, novice, or uh, need help. Those are the, uh, the four different uh, categories. And uh, sometimes there will be a, a written uh, worksheet similar to what we did during the unit that will serve as the conclusion of that three week unit. So students, I you know, talking about Google Classroom, they love the little push button, multiple choice answers because they're easy. And uh, maybe, maybe I should get with it and set more of those up, but I love them for my students to practice their writing and their thinking, their higher level. But part of that is um, idealistic. Some of them, they just would love to just push a ding, 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 ding. No, no sentences needed. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off the Q&A room for a second, just because that one's easy for me to come back to and um, ask you uh, on the Facebook stream, there was a question uh, as to if, if there was a handout available to this session um, or if there's a way to get some of the resources that uh, you were displaying uh, through the screen share. Uh, there isn't officially but I can put some of these together into a PDF packet and send them to someone like you, Chuck, and then uh, you could uh, distribute that. Or uh, better yet, uh, send me a request at guitarmusicman.com 
and my homework will be to put a little packet of this together, which also uh, brings me to the point, a lot of our students who are tech savvy, uh, don't know how to make a PDF packet. And so I teach them how to make a PDF packet of their, uh, uh, the portfolio of their songs that they, that they have to put together. And it's a big learning experience. I, in a way, I find that I'm teaching a little bit of tech while I'm at it. It's like, oh, how do you take five PDFs and stick them together in one packet? Well, if you've never done it before, it's a little daunting, but once you've done it a couple of times, it's pretty easy. So uh, happy to do that. Uh, so we'll, I'll send you a packet, uh, Chuck. That's great. So I'd love for you to uh, you know contact me. We have a little uh, guitar teachers uh, network here in Montana, and I'd be happy to put you on that as well, even though if you, you live in some other state. Uh, Plug the website one more time for us, Steve. Guitarmusicman.com. Excellent. A question came in on uh, that's YouTube. The email. That's email. Uh, that's the email. That's email. Yeah. Question came in via YouTube from Job Jimenez. Uh, how do you not lose enthusiasm? Like how to maintain enthusiasm? He, he's clearly sensing how much of it you have. Love. Yeah. Um, uh, every student is a miracle. And every student, this is my view, has a soul that is beautiful. And... Uh, so it's not just about music, it's about love. I know that's a corny answer, uh, but uh, if it was just about music, you know, come on now. That <laughs> uh, although on the same token, sometimes students will ask me, who's your favorite guitar player? Who's your favorite? And you know my answer, Chuck. It's you. Because <laughs> in our society, it's always somebody famous off of YouTube. It's not uh, music in culture. It's when you play your song, that's my favorite. So you, you like Eric Clapton? I've never met Eric Clapton. You like Django Reinhardt? Oh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I never really met him. I, I listened to him in the gym this morning, but he's not my favorite. You are. And I love that. I'm going to have to remember that one and, and, and change my response, which has usually been um, whoever I'm listening to at the time. Yeah, it's like, well, it's differentiating between a recorded music or music, music, music. And uh, so I hold up a picture of a guitar, so then I, and I'll say, "What is this?" And they say, "Well, it's a guitar." Are you sure? No, it's a picture of a guitar. That's different than a guitar. I'm going to go to the Q and A. We've got a question from Brian Cross. I love the way you've incorporated lyrics and the voice. Hi there. We're sorry to cut uh, so short away from uh, that uh, Q&A. If you're still interested in hearing all the great things that Steve, Chuck, and Matt are talking about, you can go to, cut, uh, uh, so I'm going to get my, uh, we're going to have a brief, uh, you can go to Zoom, essentially. We're having a, 
there we go. So if you want to hear all those things, we can, you can go see them on Zoom. I uh, find uh, the link in the chat. Uh, we just had a little brief audio interruption there. Um, so our, our audio went down, and we're going to move on, unfortunately. So, But I'm here to tell you about what's coming up tomorrow. Tomorrow, just like today was our education track day, we have a track day devoted to guitar societies. So if you are part of a guitar society, uh, have gone to see a concert put on by a guitar society, um, this is a great day to kind of you know, meet some people and uh, collaborate through that. So we have some events part of that in block two, but I'm going to tell you about the stuff that's going on in block one. We have a masterclass by Agnello Desiderio. We have our International Ensemble Competition Showcase, and that will feature artists from all the past uh, competitions throughout uh, its uh, running from, I believe, 2017, something like that. Um, so that's great. Um, in the morning, we will have a uh, tribute uh, to one of the artists who uh, unfortunately uh, passed. Um, she was supposed to be part of this bill and she was not able to be. Um, Sabrina Vasalik. Um, and we'll have a tribute for her starting at 10 a.m. Uh, by some uh, people who knew her very well um, in the guitar world. So, just like at the end of every block, we have Lagrima. And I am here today to also introduce that artist. And our artist for today, this block, is Rafael Smits. Thank mm -hmm. you. 